Chapters fourteen through eighteen, Book four, Volume one, of Le Mot d'Arthur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Janice in Georgia. Le Mot d'Arthur. Volume One by Sir Thomas Mallory. Book Four, Chapters Fourteen to Eighteen. Chapter Fourteen How Queen Morgan le Fay made great sorrow for the death of Acolon, and how she stole away the scabbard from Arthur. Then came tidings unto Morgan le Fay that Acolon was dead and his body brought unto the church, and how King Arthur had his sword again. But when Queen Morgan wist that Acolon was dead, she was so sorrowful that near her heart to brast. But because she would not it were known, outward she kept her countenance, and made no semblant of sorrow. But well she wist, and she abode till her brother Arthur came thither, there should no gold go for her life. Then went she unto Queen Guinevere, and asked her leave to ride into the country. Ye may abide, said Queen Guinevere, till your brother the king come home. I may not, said Morgan le Fay, for I have such hasty tidings that I may not tarry. Well, said Guinevere, ye may depart when ye will. So early on the morn, or it was day, she took her horse and rode all that day and most part of the night, and on the morn by noon she came to the same abbey of nuns whereas lay King Arthur. And she, knowing he was there, she asked where he was, and they answered how he had laid him in his bed to sleep for he had had but little rest these three nights. Well, said she, I charge you that none of you wake him till I do. And then she alighted off her horse, and thought for to steal away Excalibur his sword. And so she went straight into his chamber, and no man durst disobey her commandment. And there she found Arthur asleep in his bed, and Excalibur in his right hand naked. When she saw that she was passing heavy, that she might not come by the sword without she had waked him, and then she wist well she had been dead. Then she took the scabbard and went her way on horseback. When the king awoke and missed his scabbard, he was wroth, and he asked who had been there, and they said his sister, Queen Morgan, had been there, and had put the scabbard under her mantle and was gone. Alas, said Arthur, falsely ye have watched me. Sir, said they all, we durst not disobey your sister's commandment. Ah, said the king, let fetch the best horse may be found, and bid Sir Anslake arm him in all haste, and take another good horse and ride with me. So anon the king and Anslake were well armed, and rode after this lady. And so they came by a cross, and found a cowherd. And they asked the poor man if there came any lady riding that way. Sir, said this poor man, right late came a lady riding with the forty horses, and to yonder forest she rode. Then they spurred their horses, and followed fast. And within a while Arthur had a sight of Morgan le Fay. Then he chased as fast as he might. When she espied him following her, she rode a greater pace through the forest till she came to a plain, and when she saw she might not escape, she rode unto a lake thereby, and said, Whatsoever come of me, my brother shall not have the scabbard. And then she let throw the scabbard into the deepest of the water, so it sank for it was heavy of gold and precious stones. Then she rode into a valley where many great stones were, and when she saw she must be overtaken, she shaped herself, 
horse and man by enchantment unto a great marble stone. Anon withal came Sir Arthur and Sir Anselake, whereas the king might know his sister and her men, and one knight from another. Ah, said the king, here may ye see the vengeance of God, and now am I sorry that this misadventure is befallen. And then he looked for the scabbard, but it would not be found, so he returned to the abbey where he came from. So when Arthur was gone, she turned all into the likeliness as she and they were before, and said, Sirs, now may we go where we will. Chapter 15 How Morgan le Fay saved a knight that should have been drowned, and how King Arthur returned home again. Then said Morgan, Saw ye Arthur, my brother? Yea, said her knights, right well, and that ye should have found, and we might have stirred from one stead, for by his army vestal countenance he would have caused us to have fled. I believe you, said Morgan. Anon, after, as she rode, she met a knight leading another knight on his horse before him, bound hand and foot, blindfold, to have drowned him in a fountain. When she saw this knight so bound, she asked him, What will you do with that knight? Lady, said he, I will drown him. For what cause? she asked. For I found him with my wife, and she shall have the same death anon. That were pity, said Morgan le Fay. Now what say ye, knight? Is it truth that he said of you? She said to the knight that should be drowned. Nay, truly, madam, he saith not right on me. Of whence be ye, said Morgan le Fay, and of what country? I am of the court of King Arthur, and my name is Manassin, cousin unto Aklan of Gaul. Ye say well, said she, and for the love of him ye shall be delivered and ye shall have your adversary in the same case ye be in. So Manassin was loosed, and the other knight bound. And anon Manassin unarmed him, and armed himself in his harness, and so mounted on horseback, and the knight afore him, and so threw him into a fountain, and drowned him. And then he rode unto Morgan again, and asked if she would anything unto King Arthur. Tell him that I rescued thee, not for the love of him, but for the love of Acolon, and tell him I fear him not, while I can make me and them that be with me in likeness of stones, and let him wit I can do much more when I see my time. And so she departed into the country of Gore, and there she was richly received, and made her castles and towns passing strong for always she dreaded much King Arthur. When the king had well rested him at the abbey, he rode unto Camelot, and found his queen and his barons right glad of his coming. And when they heard of his strange adventures, as is afore rehearsed, then all had marvel of the falsehood of Morgan le Fay. Many knights wished her burnt. Then came Manassin to court, and told the king of his adventure. Well, said the king, she is a kind sister. I shall so be avenged on her, and I live, that all Christendom shall speak of it. So on the morn there came a damsel from Morgan to the king, and she brought with her the richest mantle that ever was seen in that court for it was set as full of precious stones as one might stand by another, and they were the richest stones that ever the king saw. And the damsel said, Your sister sendeth you this mantle, and desireth that ye should take this gift of her, and in what thing she hath offended you she will amend it at your own pleasure. When the king beheld this mantle, it pleased him much, but he said but little. Chapter 16 
how the damosel of the lake saved King Arthur from mantle that should have burned him. With that came the damosel of the lake unto the king, and said, Sir, I must speak with you in privity. Say on, said the king, what ye will. Sir, said the damsel, put not on you this mantle till ye have seen more, and in no wise let it not come on you, nor on no knight of yours, till ye command the bringer thereof to put it upon her. Well, said King Arthur, it shall be done as ye counsel me. And then he said unto the damosel that came from his sister, Damosel, this mantle that ye have brought me, I will see it upon you. Sir, she said, it will not beseem me to wear a king's garment. By my head, said Arthur, ye shall wear it, or it come on my back, or any man's that here is. And so the king made it to be put upon her, and forthwithal she fell down dead, and never more spake word after, and burnt to coal. Then was the king wonderly wroth, more than he was to forehand, and said unto king Uriens, My sister, your wife, is alway about to betray me, and well I wot either ye or my nephew your son is of counsel with her to have me destroyed. But as for you, said the king to king Uriens, I deem not greatly that ye be of her counsel. For Acolon confessed to me by his own mouth that she would have destroyed you as well as me, therefore I hold you excused. But as for your son, Sir Uwain, I hold him suspect, therefore I charge you put him out of my court. So Sir Uwain was discharged. And when Sir Gawain wist that, he made him ready to go with him, and said, Whoso banisheth my cousin Germain shall banish me. So they two departed, and rode into a great forest, and so they came to an abbey of monks, and there were well lodged. But when the king wist that Sir Gawain was departed from the court, there was made great sorrow among all the estates. Now, said Gaheris, Gawain's brother, we have lost two good knights for the love of one. So on the morn they heard their masses in the abbey, and so they rode forth till that they came to a great forest. Then was Sir Gawain ware in a valley of a turret of twelve fair damosels, and two knights armed on great horses, and the damosels went to and fro by a tree. And then was Sir Gawain ware how there hung a white shield on that tree, and ever as the damosels came by it they spit upon it, and some threw mire upon the shield. Chapter 17 How Sir Gawain and Sir Uwain met with twelve fair damosels, and how they complained on Sir Marhaus. Then Sir Gawain and Sir Uwain went and saluted them, and asked why they did that despite to the shield. Sir, said the damosels, we shall tell you. There is a knight in this country that owneth this white shield, and he is a passing good man of his hands, but he hateth all ladies and gentlewomen, and therefore we do all this despite to the shield. I shall say you, said Sir Gawain, it beseemeth evil a good knight to despise all ladies and gentlewomen, and peradventure, though he hate you, he hath some certain cause, and peradventure he loveth in some other places ladies and gentlewomen, and to be loved again, and he be such a man of prowess as ye speak of. Now, what is his name? Sir, said they, his name is Marhaus, the king's son of Ireland. I know him well, said Sir Uwain. He is a passing good knight as any is alive, for I saw him once proved at a jousts where many knights were gathered, and that time there might no man withstand him. Ah, said Sir Gawain, 
Damozels, methinketh ye are to blame, for it is to suppose that he hung that shield there, he will not be long therefrom, and then may those knights match him on horseback, and that is more your worship than thus. For I will abide no longer to see a knight's shield dishonoured. And therewith Sir Uwain and Gawain departed a little from them, and then were they ware where Sir Marhaus came riding on a great horse straight toward them. And when the twelve damosels saw Sir Marhaus, they fled into the turret as they were wild, so that some of them fell by the way. Then the one of the knights on the tower dressed his shield and said on high, Sir Marhaus, defend thee. And so they ran together, that the knight brake his spear on Marhaus, and Marhaus smote him so hard that he brake his neck and the horse's back. That saw the other knight of the turret, and dressed him toward Marhaus, and they met so eagerly together that the knight of the turret was soon smitten down, horse and man stark dead. Chapter 18 how Sir Marhaus jousted with Sir Gawain and Sir Uwain, and overthrew them both. And then Sir Marhaus rode unto his shield, and saw how it was defiled, and said, Of this despite I am a part avenged, but for her love that gave me this white shield I shall wear thee, and hang mine where thou wast. And so he hanged it about his neck. Then rode he straight unto Sir Gawain and to Sir Uwain, and asked them what they did there. They answered him that they came from King Arthur's court to see adventures. Well, said Sir Marhaus, here am I ready, an adventurous knight that will fulfill any adventure that ye will desire. And so departed from them to fetch his reign. Let him go, said Sir Uwain unto Sir Gawain, for he is a passing good knight as any is living. I would not by my will that any of us were matched with him. Nay, said Sir Gawain, not so. It were shame to us were he not assayed, were he never so good a knight. Well, said Sir Uwain, I will assay him afore you, for I am more weaker than ye, and if he smite me down, then may ye revenge me. So these two knights came together with great rondon, that Sir Uwain smote Sir Marhaus, that his spear brast in pieces on the shield, and Sir Marhaus smote him so sore, that horse and man he bare to the earth, and hurt Sir Uwain on the left side. Then Sir Marhaus turned his horse, and rode toward Gawain with his spear. And when Sir Gawain saw that, he dressed his shield, and they aventured their spears, and they came together with all the might of their horses, that either knight smote other so hard in the midst of their shields, but Sir Gawain's spear brake, but Sir Marhaus's spear held. And therewith Sir Gawain and his horse rushed down to the earth. And lightly Sir Gawain rose on his feet, and pulled out his sword, and dressed him towards Sir Marhaus on foot. And Sir Marhaus saw that, and pulled out his sword, and began to come to Sir Gawain on horseback. Sir Knight, said Sir Gawain, alight on foot, or else I will slay thy horse. Gramercy, said Sir Marhaus, of your gentleness ye teach me courtesy, for it is not for one knight to be on foot, and the other on horseback. And therewith Sir Marhaus set his spear against the tree, and alighted, and tied his horse to a tree, and dressed his shield. And either came unto other eagerly, and smote together with their swords, that their shields flew in cantles. And they bruised their helms and their hauberks, and wounded each other. But Sir Gawain from it past nine of the clock waxed ever stronger and stronger, for then it came to the hour of noon, and thrice his might was increased. 
all this espied Sir Marhouse, and had great wonder how his might increased, and so they wounded other passing sore. And when it was past noon, and when it drew toward evensong, Sir Gawain's strength feebled, and waxed passing faint, that unneths he might dure any longer, and Sir Marhaus was then bigger and bigger. Sir Knight, said Sir Marhaus, I have well felt that ye are a passing good knight, and a marvellous man of might as ever I felt any, while it lasteth, and our quarrels are not great, and therefore it were pity to do you hurt, for I feel ye are passing feeble. Ah, said Sir Gawain, gentle knight, ye say the word that I should say. And therewith they took off their helms, and either kissed other, and there they swore together either to love other as brethren. And Sir Marhaus prayed Sir Gawain to lodge with him that night. And so they took their horses and rode toward Sir Marhaus's house. And as they rode by the way, Sir Knight, said Sir Gawain, I have marvel that so valiant a man as ye be love no ladies nor damosels. Sir, said Sir Marhaus, they name me wrongfully those that give me that name, but well I wot it be the damosels of the turret that so name me, and others such as they be. Now shall I tell you for what cause I hate them, for they be sorceresses and enchanters, many of them, and be a knight never so good of his body and full of prowess as a man may be, they will make him a stark coward to have the better of him. And this is the principal cause that I hate them. And to all good ladies and gentlewomen I owe my service as a knight ought to do. As the book rehearseth in French, there were many knights that overmatched Sir Gawain, for all the thrice might that he had, Sir Launcelot de Lac, Sir Tristram, Sir Bors de Ganis, Sir Percival, Sir Pelias, and Sir Marhaus, these six knights had the better of Sir Gawain. Then within a little while they came to Sir Marhaus's place, which was in a little priory, and there they alighted, and ladies and damosels unarmed them, and hastily looked to their hurts, for they were all three hurt. And so they had all three good lodging with Sir Marhaus, and good cheer. For when he wist that they were King Arthur's sister's sons, he made them all the cheer that lay in his power. And so they sojourned there a sennight, and were well eased of their wounds, and at the last departed. Now, said Sir Marhaus, we will not depart so lightly, for I will bring you through the forest and rode day by day well a seven days, or they found any adventure. At the last they came into a great forest that was named the Country and Forest of Arroy, and the Country of Strange Adventures. In this country, said Sir Marhaus, came never night since it was christened, but he found strange adventures. And so they rode and came into a deep valley full of stones and thereby they saw a fair stream of water. Above thereby was the head of the stream a fair fountain, and three damosels sitting thereby. And then they rode to them, and either saluted other, and the eldest had a garland of gold about her head, and she was three score winter of age or more, and her hair was white under the garland. The second damosel was of thirty winter of age, with a circlet of gold about her head. The third damosel was but fifteen year of age, and a garland of flowers about her head. When these knights had so beheld them, they asked them the cause why they sat at that fountain. We be here, said the damosels, for this cause. If we may see any errant knights, to teach them unto strange adventures. And ye be three knights that seek adventures, and we be three damosels, 
Therefore each one of you must choose one of us. And when ye have done so, we will lead you unto three highways. And there each of you shall choose a way, and his damosel with him. And this day twelvemonth ye must meet here again, and God send you your lives, and thereto ye must plight your troth. This is well said, said Sir Marhaus. End of Book 4, Chapters 14 through 18